And hello, bonjour, welcome to another episode at Live at Moon. And today, as promised, we have a super phenomenal, fantastic guest, which I am really excited. He is also known as being an, a column writer, uh, column writer for the Montreal Gazette, Mr. Bill Zaharku. Hey, nice. Bill. Devin. Thank you for coming, and we got stuff. <laughs> First of all, I'm very impressed that you got the name right. Oh. Right? Like, it took my own kids, like, two years to figure out how to say Zaharku, but... Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was pretty simple. It was no, straightforward, yeah. Zaharku. It seemed to just roll off your tongue, dude. Well, of course, I have been listening to you a lot. Um, Bill also did a lot of segments on the Montreal radio station, um, Shom 97.7, on Friday mornings for uh, several, at least a few uh, years. Since 2012. Since 2000, yeah. The last year. Has it been that long? Yep. yep. Wow. And I listened every Friday, and then I was looking, what kind of segment can I do that really grasps the culture that we love our music? We've done a lot of music segments. We've talked about a lot of equipment, of course. But... I also have a wine side in me, and I'm like, who can I call? Bill. So here we are, we got Bill, and Bill has brought some really special stuff for us. But um, also what we're gonna, uh, everyone can already see the bottle of wine on the table. Uh, we will get into that, um, but the question is- And it's is, not a paid placement. It's not a paid These placement. These are choices. <laughs> These are all personal choices <laughs> yeah, by exactly. Bill himself. So basically what we're here to discover is, because when I talked to you and explained kind of with the segment what I wanted to do is uh, we wanted to bring your expertise of wine, but also you're a fan of music, just like a lot of us here too. Yeah. And your segments on Shom was a lot of comparisons of like wine, and then you would talk about a certain song. So how do you mix the two together? This is like so, I always found this so interesting. Like, Well, I mean, I think the root of the whole thing was that I've always been a bit of a... Um, uh, bastardizer of, <laughs> of wine where, uh, you know, again, it's that revolutionary, it's the old mm -hmm. skate punk in me that um, always seemed to, like, you know that the sommelier, I, like, I hate being called a sommelier, even okay. when I work on the floor, you know, because it you knows that guy in the suit with like, the little cup, you know, have you ever seen those guys? Yeah, well, I've seen them. And people ask me, where's your cup? And I said, I don't even know what the hell you're supposed to do with that thing. <laughs> um, but for me, it's always been to take wine and bring it down to a level that everybody can understand. Because mm -hmm. the ironic thing about, like I spent, I spent what, two, like 13 years going around the world talking to winemakers. And winemakers, they're farmers. Yeah. They're simple people. But somehow between them and the final product, there's this snobism that seemed to like take over. And it's something that I always I've tried to rebel against. And so when, I was asked by uh, the Shom people to come on and do uh, um, a wine segment. Mm -hmm. I said, the only way I'm going to do this is if you let me DJ. Oh. And they were going like, <laughs> what? And I was, I was like, well, I grew up in the West Island, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, Shom taught me about music, at least the rock aspect of music. And uh, I, my dream was always to DJ on Shom. So I said, there's no limit. I can put whatever I want on, and mm -hmm. then I'll do this. And it seemed to work quite well. And it did. I, I personally love the Friday segments. There, I, every Friday I looked forward to it. I made sure I tuned in for that, either if I was in the car or at home, yeah. at work. <laughs> yeah, and, and the idea behind the whole thing was that, you know, again, like a lot of people get put off by all the, the wine lingo that people use. You know, mm -hmm. the rub, the aromatics. Like if, if, if it's something interesting, if it's something cool that, that's easy for people to, to figure out, mm -hmm. um, sure, I'll mention it. I'll talk about it. But for me... It's about the stories, it's about the history, and then trying to, what for me separates a wine that I really like from a wine that doesn't turn me on or I dislike, is something which is more emotive, okay. right? And that's where you get the tie-in with music, right? Because mm -hmm. why do you like that song more than that song, right? You can't really it's break it down parts. into its component parts. It's like, there's something about there it's like, why does this kind of beat attract me more than that kind exactly. of beat? Exactly. So you know? kind of, there is a relationship. And there's a mood factor too, right? Like, yeah, for and, sure. You know, there's very good wines that sometimes I'll taste, and it's just like, I know that wine, I've liked that wine, but it's really not hitting me right now. Mm -hmm. So um, anyways, for me, it was, it was just a way to try and, you know, again, we had, you know, hundreds, of, you know, over 100,000 people listening at times, is that, you know, okay, most of those people don't really know about wine. Some of them really like it, mm -hmm. you know, but 
you know, most people don't really think that much more about it, right? So they're not going to want to get into the lingo and the whole thing. And I figured if I was able to take the spirit of that wine and kind of boil it down into a song or a style of music, what would I do? And for me, it became this fascinating thing. I would spend much more time choosing the music than the wine. I'm surprised they haven't come out with a university course for this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, Concordia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, again, and the, and the other thing for me was that wine is often associated with you know classical music yep. and jazz music mm -hmm. and more the the fancy hoity-toity stuff, and which is fabulous music. Like I, I listen to both, right? But um, again, it's to bring it down and and to rock, right? Which I think is a very universal language. Um, especially to our generation, or my generation, you're a bit younger, but eh, you know, I think, I think you got, I got some time on you, dude. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean. It's like it's so I, most of the shown people, um, you know, are, are you know probably in that 35 to 55, mm -hmm. 60 range now, yep. and um, you know, again, rock for me was is as evocative and as emotional as any other type of music, right? So. But I found your segments with them really brought out like what Shom really stood for too. It was like a really natural segment. It's it's sad that it's no longer happening, but times change and maybe one change. day, maybe one day we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back. back and I have thought of resurrecting it as uh, in some sort of podcast form or something, but uh, you know, we'll oh, see. he's pouring. We're pouring. So I guess this is going to bring us to our first one. Exactly. So, Bill, what are, you, what are you pouring us right now? Okay, well, I, the three we're going to do three wines. And um, <laughs> all three food groups. So a rosé, a white, and a red. Sounds good. figure that's going to cross all the borders. And you said that you don't like rosé and you don't like white. So well, this no, is I, I, I kind of like rosés, but the whites, like I mentioned in our little chat, I, I, I don't think I've experienced a good enough, like, I don't think I've given it too much of a chance, and yeah, I, I haven't been able to, I can't say I'm a white drinker, but yet you're telling me my persona matches a white drinker. I think you're ready. But anyway, let's start with that. Now, you tell me what was the first thing that you did when I, because we've been drinking for a bit, but you- It's not true. You tell me, you tell me what was the, your first reaction when you first smelt that one. Um, actually, the, the, I, this is a, I've never smelt a rosé like this before. Exactly. And still, yeah, still, and right? it's, it's 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 full. Yeah, it's just there's full. fruit. There's that's, there's a floral note to it. There's a herbal note to it. Like it's a very complex thing. It right? is. Okay, now here's the story. Have a sip. I'll okay. go into that after. But this is this is a quick story. But this is this is when I got schooled. Even in the taste wise, mm -hmm. it's one I can say I honestly have never experienced in a rose. Okay, so in, in, a, in a previous life, this was around, uh, must have been around 2005, 2006, the owner of, of Le Petal de Rose, mm -hmm. uh, Régine Sumer, who's a fabulous woman, and she's the one who, in fact, invented the way Provence rosés are made okay. in the modern times, which is using a champagne press, because these are all made with red grapes, and you notice the color is really. What a lot of the the winemakers down in Provence call uh, le blanc taché de Régine. Okay. Right, which I thought is, you know, again, but she made the style, right? So it was a very light press, like they do in Champagne. It's like this big sort of bladder, if you want, that gently presses the the grape, so only a little bit of color comes out. But she came to uh, where I was working at uh, Loa La Bouche, and we were doing a whole night of her wine. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to her about service temperature and how, you know, should I open up the reds earlier or the whites and so on and so forth. And we hit the rosé first and she goes, uh, I want my rosé served at 14 degrees. Okay. And I was like, what? Right? Because like most people in Quebec, the goal of a, you know, of, a, of serving rosé is to make it as close to a freezy mm -hmm. as possible. Yep. Right? And keep it as close to a freezy as possible. Stick. <laughs> exactly. It should be just, it could almost be like a slushy. Um, and I served the wine at probably 12 degrees all night. And people were looking, this is one of the best selling rosés in Quebec and has been for over 20 years. And people were saying, is this the same petal de rose that I can buy here? And I, of course, like, took all the credit and went, yeah, but it's made with red grapes, so it should really be served around 12 degrees. But you see the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So not only aromatically is it interesting, and can you smell it, and it's just, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, no, it's 
definitely and super interesting as interesting as a red wine right because you yeah. said that you really like those, those i enjoy my reds yes you enjoy your reds because you but you like you said that you like the not just the dominant factors but the nuances and the subtleties exactly. right and that's that's exactly what you get here right and when you drink it because we're up at that 10 12 degree range mm -hmm. You actually get texture, right? You actually get flavor, as opposed to when it's four degrees, acid. Okay. Right? So you know, this is how you can, you know, because, you know, I get this all the time when people come to my house. Why do wines taste better here? Well, the ABCs of wine service, mm -hmm. temperature, temperature, temperature. So remember that. Temperature. 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 <laughs> right? But it, it's, it's everything. Right? And here in... You know, again, and this is actually worldwide because I've, I've been lucky enough to drink wine all over the world, is mm -hmm. that we tend to drink our, red, our whites and roses way too cold and we drink our reds too warm. Hmm. And the, you've got a window, 8 to 18. Nothing should ever be served under 8 unless it really sucks. Right, like you got, <laughs> like if you got that really bad, like you know, eight dollar wine. Uh, it's like I need my wine fix. Yeah, what like can that. I do to make you, it you better? Go, you can go freezy, but basically, <laughs> eight degrees is what you want, and in reds, uh, eighteen. Like, okay. So like the the bigger reds, eighteen degrees, but mm -hmm. if you get Beaujolais and lighter reds, sixteen, fifteen degrees, and you know, I have a, a ice bucket that I, you know, sort of have around with me in the summer. It ain't for my wife. Oh, really? It's my red, right? It's Constantly friends. dunking them because you want to keep them cool, hmm. right? And with that, you'll, you'll be able, because the thing is, when you go above that, you're just going to get alcohol. You're going to get the wood. You're not going to get the nuance and the fruit yeah. and the acidity and the freshness, right? Well, like you've mentioned before, it's like, have you ever had a really cold red? And it's like, like it's, not, it's not desirable because no. you get nothing out of it. Because you get nothing out of it. You get no aromatics. Nope. And so everything... It's like everything's frozen. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's really your job to, as a as a wine lover, um, to try and put the white the the wine in its best posi um, possible position to succeed, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's changing the glass, whether it's like drinking it tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of wines that uh, you know my girlfriend will will attest also, to this. It's like we drink one, and then it's like okay, that that's not great, and I'll put the cork back in, put it back in the fridge the next day. Often it's great. It's funny you mention that too because uh, I know over the years there's always been this great debate. It's like, can you actually recork it and burn it back and yeah. put it aside? That's always been like a thing too. Like, no one really, a lot of people don't really know if you can or can't do that. And yeah, this stuff isn't fine china, man. Like, I know. Uh, I did a I did a blind taste. It's like ordering a pizza. You order a pizza one night, but if you put it and reheat it the next day, it could be just as good, if not better, sometimes. <laughs> Especially if you had too much to drink the night before. That morning pizza is pretty good. But we, I did at Shom one time, I did a blind tasting um, where I took a, it was a good wine, but it was like $16, $17 Portuguese red, a Dow. And the only difference between the two was I popped the cork, took out one ounce, and put the cork back in 24 hours earlier. Hmm. Right? So I brown bagged them, right? And, yeah, yeah. You know, and I said, all you have to tell me is which one's more expensive. Both of them, Heather and Terry, mm -hmm. both like pointed to the one that was open the day before, and they went, "This must be like twice as expensive." Wasn't that one of the episodes? Yeah, it was an episode. Yeah, yeah I yeah, remember yeah, that yeah. episode. Yeah. And they were blown away, and because the exact same wine, all the only difference was it had twenty four hours of very gentle oxidation. Hmm. And so it's like, yeah, I mean, play around with it, like. Uh, so know, basically, don't be shy. Just try yeah, and experiment. Man. Go nuts. You know, like a, if you're going to craft your wine, a young wine. Mm -hmm. Like I use, I use a milk jug, right? And you just pour it in, froth it up, put it back in. You know, don't do that with a 20 year old Bordeaux. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, most people are drinking like basic wines. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you want to air it out, air the thing out. Or get a big glass, leave it in the glass for like a 10, yeah, 15 minutes sure. and then have it. You know, so there so you go. So now about this wine. Okay, got a yeah. Bit of the, uh... So La Petale de yeah. Rose, uh, Grenache saint so uh, sometimes there's Syrah in here, but um, again, as I said, like these are red grapes, mm -hmm. the Provence style, which is, you know, again, is, there's a bunch of different types of so ways you can make rosé. You know, you use the classic way was the Seigne, mm -hmm. which is you're making a red wine, your, your grapes, because all the, all, the, all the color comes from the, from the skins, right? Mm -hmm. 
So for a red wine, you have to keep the, the fermentation and keep you know, pushing down all the skins. But what they'll do is, in the early days of the fermentation, they'll, they'll suck out some of the juice, right? Which will mean it, it'll concentrate the amount of juice per cap, right? Skins and okay. stems and all that kind of stuff. And what they would do with the rest of this stuff is make a rosé out of it. So that's a mm. saigné. This stuff, the grapes are grown specifically to make rosé. And so they'll harvest it a little bit earlier than they would for a red wine because you want to have that freshness, that acidity. So you have a little bit less color build up, we call phenolics, mm -hmm. tannins and all that kind of stuff. They'll put it in the press very gently with the champagne, with this bladder. They'll just pull out the juice. And it just adds a little bit of that color. And that's what you get. So for me, this is like I would a little bit cooler, you know, mm -hmm. aperitif, perfect. Really interesting, but again, not a lot cooler. As I said, we were, yeah. were talking, pull your rosé out of the fridge, put it on the counter. Yeah. You can have cool. your first one cool. And then for us, we would drink this with uh, oof, anything with tomatoes. You know, the classic would be like a, a salad, uh, uh, the Provençal, classic Provençal okay. salad. Um, you know, because again, there is, there's flavor there, right? There's mm -hmm. taste, so it can handle tuna, it can handle uh, even stuff like anchovies and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's enough acidity to go with like fresh tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really the all purpose. Now, wine. the question that I've been dying and waiting to ask for is mm. what, would you what would you listen to while drinking this? Well, now we're getting, now the we're getting into the thing. So we, we can't look at this though, eh? I just want to look no, at we the. No, can, we can show it. Oh, we can show it, okay. Yeah. Well, for me, rose is all about, again, it's not a complicated thing, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Yes, it is. Right? But for me, it, when I drink this, it immediately puts me into that sitting in the sun. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a bit stereotype, but I mean, that's generally when we drink rose. Yeah, you can drink, I mean, you nice can. And hot out and yeah, you like can that. drink them, but you can drink this all year round. Right? But most people, and I'm equally guilty of it, when it's hot out, that's when I love it. And you're on the, you know, you're on the balcony and you've got like, the, like that yep. little summer breeze. Oh yeah. And then you just have that beside you. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's really so good. for me, it's really just, um, uh, it's that, that feeling of just pure sort of joy and smooth and laying back. And for me, it's that sort of the California vibe. I love California. I think California is a spectacular place with a spectacular <laughs> climate. And there's some pretty spectacular music that came out of there. And uh, for me, it was Over My Head, which was, for me, one of my, is probably my favorite Fleetwood Mac song of all time. This is the album. So why exactly, so Over My Head, I, I love Fleetwood. Actually, believe it or not, my, I named my daughter after one of the songs, Rhiannon. Oh, no, really? Okay. <laughs> that's my Fleetwood Mac story. There you Mac go, story. that's pretty good, man. But uh, when you told me Fleetwood Mac, and um, uh, I'd like to thank my, my neighbor, Norman, uh, for lending us this, uh, thanks a lot. This one actually was really pretty hard to find. Um, yeah, definitely. I can see where you're going with, um, the but you know, how over my head just has that. It just has that, that starts at that, doom, da, doom, da, doom, da, doom, da, just yep. that little delicate rhythm to it. And again, you can find that. In, I think you can find that in this wine too, right? It's just, there's nothing, there's nothing that impedes you from joy in this, right? Mm -hmm. Like some songs you gotta, like, you gotta, you gotta embark, right? And for me, Fleetwood, with that song, you can just like put it on, put on. And the, just lay back, lay and back. go mellow with it. It's a great choice. And hopefully with that crazy sound system that I listened to. You heard the sound my, system, man. My mind is so blown, <laughs> dude. Like it is blown. We introduced Bill to the sound room as we've done with our previous guests too. And same reaction. Mm. They just are blown away by the sound. I don't even, like I was all proud because I got my my old, my old, beautiful Harman Kardon amp fix. <laughs> it is nothing compared to what I just experienced. Like, you know, I'm well, going we'll go, to be going home thinking I'm listening into a tin we're, can. We're, we're, we'll go shopping after. Yeah, exactly. Here, so don't worry. Yeah. So, all right. So, awesome. So we have once again the name is the um, La Petale de Rose. La Petale so de Rose from Chateau Le, Le Tour de l'Évêque. Uh, Disponible au SRQ. Yeah, it's around twenty bucks. I don't know the exact price, um, but it's again. This has been around. This is one of the SAQ stalwarts. Um, for me, every year I during the summer I try and you know recommend a rosé per week. Mm -hmm. And I don't, even, I don't even have to taste it. I do, because it's a joyful thing. Um, and also what is really interesting 
if you are into wine and you have a little cellar, put this down for a year. Oh, really? Yeah. Buy a couple bottles of rosé, especially the Provence rosé, or if you get into Bondol, which is technically Provence, but mm -hmm. Bondol, beefier rosés, um, put it down for a year. Okay. Just one year. And you're going to come back next year, and if you thought that was evocative aromatics... So we're in for a surprise. You're in for a surprise. Now we have two others still to go. Okay, we got to go so here. So right, we're yeah, going to yeah, put just this uh, on the side. Okay, so the other, th the, the other thing is that most people love drinking red wine, mm -hmm. and most people don't understand white wine. I am one of those people. And <laughs> me, Mr. Wine Critic Guy, I drink 85% white. Hmm. You know, again, as I explained to you earlier, it was a, it, for me, it's a function of food. Okay. Right? Wine, for me, is a spice. Oh, right? that's, a, that's an interesting. Like, I don't, hit. for me, it's my, the job of a wine is to make whatever is in front of me that I'm about to eat better. Hmm. Right? That's where I start. Well, that's what well, usually what I do is, like, when I have a good steak, I look for a good red to go with it. Too. Well, exactly. But why wouldn't you do that with any, everything else that you eat? Yeah, I know, and I'm still stuck in the reds. <laughs> exactly. So, <Bad. laughs> you know, and especially with, you know, stuff like seafood, mm -hmm. most cheeses. Like, I, not that I'm, I'm not vegetarian, I'm not dogmatic, I love steak tar, but even steak tartare is better with white wine. Hmm. And that has come from 30 years of research and a lot of money spent on Express. I think we're going to start hanging out a lot. <laughs> <more>. <laughs> no, but I, I literally would go, I lived near the Express during, uh, the, during the 90s. I will, I will drive to wherever, <laughs> wherever you live and we are going to hang out for like a couple of days and you're going to introduce me to all these wonderful whites. There you go, man. <laughs> all right, so let's talk a little bit about this one. Okay, and... so for a white, I went for a pretty classic. Um, you know, again, the, the world of white is so interesting because it's so diverse, right? Which is... Which is for me, the intellectually, as someone who's been in this business for a long time, mm -hmm. um, I just find it so much interesting, so much more interesting than red wine, because the profiles, of, whether it's in aromatics or in textures, is so vast and it's so wide. Right? I could put down a Bordeaux, a Tuscan wine, a Rioja, everything in front of you blind, mm -hmm. and I guarantee you, you would find more similarities than dissimilarity. Mm. Right? Whereas even you can take a grape like Chardonnay. And I can give you a Chardonnay from Napa Valley, from Niagara, from mm -hmm. Chablis, from Merceau, further south in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even think they were the same grape. Hmm. Which is, you know, again, is, is, is how... Because the thing is, white wine tends to be a little bit more naked, if you want. right? You don't have the oak. You don't have the alcohol, as, as it has before. So for, so for me, I love white wines because you can almost dissect them a little bit easier. And Chablis is one of the most interesting wines in the world. Hmm. So let's have a little Let's have a little uh, spin. Go see how this goes. Okay, now, dude, you got to get the spin in. I got to get the spin in. There we right? Go. Because what you're doing here, aside from looking like a wine pro, is that Pinkies you're... <laughs> exactly, you can put your pinky out if you want. But the thing is, is that, I mean, I've got a nervous habit where I'll be sitting at dinner, and I'm not even really concentrating on the wine. I'm constantly doing this. Because what you're doing is you're putting oxygen in, and what we call... The aromas come from VOAs, vol volatile, uh, arom v -A -C. Yeah, volatile aromatic compounds. Okay. So simply by putting the air into it, you're releasing these compounds. Hmm. So if you do that, now what do you smell there, man? Lots of, lots of stuff. Definitely fruity notes. What about, what about briny, salty ocean? Would I be wrong if I went more a little oaky? No, well, there shouldn't be any oak no? in this. There might be a little, it might have done some time, but it wouldn't be an oak. But just think of the of salt. Maybe I didn't shake. Should I try thinking? Oh, wait. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't eat oysters, but mm -hmm. lobster, right? Crab, or just be, Very just imagine points. last time you were at the beach, right? You know, it's you get so that. Oh, okay, you, <laughs> then you really need a vacation, right? <laughs> So now, for me, classic Chablis has, depending on what is the, the terroir, what, where exactly it's grown, mm -hmm. will have variations in fruit, but generally it comes along that green apple, maybe some lemon, might get into some stone fruits like pear and peat and stuff like that, but generally it's, it's quite tight. For me, the beauty about Chablis 
is this salty mineral note because all Chablis share one thing in common. It's grown in Kimmerugian soil, hmm. which is fossilized oyster shells. That's interesting. So that's named after a village in southern England called Kimmeridge. And that whole area, way back when, can't tell you exactly. I'm not very good at that kind of stuff, but you can Google it. Um, when, the, when, the la when it was all underwater. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is the only place that you can find this soil. And it goes from southern England through Champagne, Chablis, a little bit of Sancerre. And it's, it's like if you walk around, you pick up a rock, you'll see the oyster shell. Hmm. So, we accept this. Yeah, let's do it. Oh my. <laughs> Like for me, I think I might have just been converted. <laughs> but for me, it, for me, that's so much energy because you got this driving acidity. You have this. Don't you feel it? Just yeah. like at the end, it's almost like. But you see the saltiness on the finish, yeah, like I do. so. It's it's salty, right? And that's why oysters, Chablis, anything lobster, anything with that an iodine quality, goes so well with that. Right, because you know, again, the, the saltiness of the oysters—it'll actually reduce a bit of the saltiness in the wine, and mm -hmm. you can bring up a little bit more fruit. That's how, like, wine food actually can help wine, at the same time as the wine can actually help food. But you see, there's not a lot of fruit, right? There's not a huge expression of. There's no oak. There's nothing that is going to like shield you from tasting every bit of that seafood that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. And Actually, with that description and the taste and all that, now I see why you chose the song you did for this <laughs> one, which makes a hundred percent. Because the all yeah, the because the thing me. is, is that most people would go, ah, white wines is kind of like easy, flaky, you know, more Fleetwood Mackey. Whereas for me, when I want to make people feel intensity, I go to white wines, and I go to something like this. And like when this. I was in Chablis. I was studying all the different crews, right? Because mm -hmm. there's all these Grand crews that all have these interesting names to them, and I can, we can get into that later. But I mean, I was trying to think of ways of remembering the different, that thing that you, that stoniness, that rockiness you feel on the end, that's called minerality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can come out as actual sort of rock or dusty, gravelly stuff, or sometimes as salt, right? Which we're getting more of that saline yeah. quality right here. But it's nervy, it's intense, it's quivering. And what I tasted, Monte de Tonnerre, and so the Chablis we're tasting here is a Premier Cru, Monte Tonnerre 2019 from Louis Michel. Instantly, Immigrant Song popped into my head, right? Just that beginning, that. Yeah. And, and it's worked ever since. Which is on, uh, we can find the song on the uh, Led Zeppelin 3 vinyl. Thanks uh, to uh, my friends at uh, Phenopolis West, actually. They lent me this album for this uh, show today. they got a great vinyl selection over there. They're my go-to guys in the West mm -hmm. Island. So thank you so much. And definitely the Immigrant Song. It makes total sense to me now, yeah. especially when you're hearing the It's, like the, it's the quivery, the this wine, dude. Like, and just like the song, it's got this intense, quivery yeah. uh, drum beats going in, and then you just got... Oh, <laughs> yeah. So um, you can take that home, and I want you to buy some lobster. I'm going to have to buy some lobster. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll buy all this lobster stuff, but you got to go home with an ace. Uh, there we go. <laughs> well, I'll take that, that little lamp that you got. Oh, the little lamp? <laughs> all right, so we're going to be moving on to our third uh, sorry, and I final. Just, I just have another sip. Oh, I yeah, no. I love this stuff, man. No, I think I might finish that on my own after. <laughs> But, but isn't um, it beautiful though? Like, oh my God, no, that is absolutely fantastic. And the thing is, you got a little bit of texture there as well, but not too much, right? And no, if you went further south in Burgundy, because mm -hmm. you have Burgundy in France, right, where Chardonnay is king, Chablis is up here, right next to Champagne. And as you move south, it gets warmer. So the wine gets plumper, it gets richer. They tend to use a little oak down there as well. Mm -hmm. So there you would get a rounder, fatter, more of like a, for me, scallop, or even if you're having, let's say, chicken with a white sauce, right, and mushrooms. Mm -hmm. That perfect for that kind of stuff, right? So this is also available at the SAQ here in yeah, Quebec? That's, yeah, that'll set you back around 80 bucks. Uh, 80 bucks. You know? But it's, it's really good. It's really good. <laughs> oh, my God, it's good. You know, the thing is, is that for me, you know, great red wines under 30 bucks, 
There's oh, plenty. We're going to show you how oh, to yeah, open a real bottle of wine, too. Yeah, so <laughs> did you catch it? Was that in the frame? Yeah, so anyways, just underneath this lip here, Yep. right? Press up and just turn it, right? Yep. And the top is going to come off nice and clean, right? The key here is don't break the cork. So if you're dealing with fancy wines, you'll tend to have longer corks, mm -hmm. right? But there, that's more than enough. Do it, do this. And wine is fun. Make the pop. I love that popping noise. So that's uh, slowly disappearing too. The popping noise. Cork is being a lot replaced by. Uh, yeah, there is caps. a little bit of those screw cap things, which I don't mind. Like I like, uh, as a guy who has to open up way too many bottles every week for mm -hmm. the for the Gazette, so I can taste. I appreciate. Oh, look at that. Yeah, this will make you happier. Oh boy, <laughs> the color. <laughs> Okay, so as um, for a red, um, I went for something pretty classic. Mm -hmm. Most people love Cabernet Sauvignon. Yes. Um, I'm not as huge as fan. I do like Bordeaux, but Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon is always blended away. Mm -hmm. right? you got, it's usually a mix of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot are the two dominant ones. Then you got Petit Verdot, you have Cabernet Franc, you have a couple little mm -hmm. satellite grapes. Um, I went to Italy because I found this when I first tasted this wine years ago. I found it very sort of Bordeaux, or I call it, uh, j'appelle ça quoi, Bordeaux en vacances. Bordeaux en vacances. <laughs> so in Italy, in <laughs> Tuscany, it's a little bit warmer than you get mm -hmm. in Bordeaux. So you just get a little bit more fruit. You get a little bit more, you know, wow factor, I guess, aromatically. Whereas mm -hmm. Bordeaux tends to be, you know, rather elegant and finesse, and that's the beauty about it. And uh, mixed with a little bit of Sangiovese, which keeps, you know, Sangiovese always has that little more earthier tones mm -hmm. and a lot of acidity. So it keeps it fresher. Now, this Argiano, uh, one of, it's one of my favorite estates in Tuscany. Um, they come from the Montalcino area, so they made their name in Brunello and Rosso de Montalcino. So, Brunello, are you a Brunello fan? Have you ever? I can't say. Uh... Brunello's expensive, yeah. right? Yeah, Brunello's <laughs> basically entry into that game is around fifty bucks, but that is, you know, again one of the best known wines. I usually of find myself in the section les petits prix. <laughs> les petits prix, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. But you can buy for around twenty to twenty-five dollars lots of Rosso de Montalcino. Yes, th those so are that's nice. those are good. Those are basically baby Brunellos. Okay. They don't do as much oak, um, maybe a slightly bigger yield, but same theme. Mm -hmm. I, in fact most often prefer the Rosso hmm. because I'm a, I'm a white wine guy, so I like fruit. Yeah. Right? And I don't like oak. Like I'm a bit allergic to that whole thing. And um, so with the Rossos, I spend less. Generally, the wines I find more delicious and fruitier and a bit easier. Hmm. So this has, they, like many Tuscan wineries, um, now just a little bit of history behind Argiano, just because there's a lot of... I don't think people here get a sense of how long these people have been making wine. Like Chablis was founded in the ninth century, hmm. right? Just a little while ago. It was a little <laughs> while ago, right? And the first mentions of, of actual Chardonnay growing everywhere is the 14th century. So you figure after 600 years, you kind of got things figured out. Mm -hmm. Right? And I, I tell this story a lot because I, people ask me all the time, it's like, Bill, I want to learn about wine. You know, how do I do this? And for me, it's, you know, yeah, you can take a course if you want, do it. But you have to go in with a certain attitude, mm -hmm. which is, if you're drinking a wine from a really good producer in an area that's been growing this grape and making these wines for hundreds or thousands of years, if you don't like it, it's your fault. And if you go into every single wine saying, okay, I got to figure this thing out, then you're going to become an infinitely better wine person. Then it's a question of making sure that you remember all the stuff that yeah. you drank. That's why we have <laughs> fancy telephones that can take pictures yep. like right away. Um, and, and then doing your own research. But if you go in with that and say, okay, like, I don't quite get this right now. It's a little bit off. It's like, you know, when you, you get frustrated because your kids, I don't like Brussels sprouts, and the next day, I don't yeah, like, yeah, my kids you know, look like that. Yeah. yeah, I don't <laughs> like chicken. It's like, you're an idiot. You like chicken yesterday, right? But the, 
if you go in with that attitude and say, okay, it's up to me to figure out how to do this, do this best. I'm not saying that every wine is going to become your favorite. That's not the point. But the idea is to expand your palate, right? Try it with different foods, you know? Learn about it. Put it in a different glass. Cool it off a bit. You know, there's lots of things that you can do. But try and understand what's going on. Read about it. I think we're going to have to have a second segment. <laughs> <laughs> because this, is, this is so much stuff in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into this one here. Yep. And tell us a little bit what we're going to be expecting. Okay, so Cabernet, Merlot, Sangiovese. So I said Bordeaux on vacation. So you're going to get classic Cab notes. Like Cab is a very easy yep. grape to understand. You're going to get that dark fruit. It's going to be cassis or it's going to be blackberry, right? It's one or yeah, the other, right? Yeah, this is more of a familiar smell for me now. Like this is more Yeah, what I'm used with to. a little bit of oak, but... Mm -hmm. You get that, for me, it's very, that's more that blackberry note, yeah. right? And then you, because of what the Merlot, so Cab gives you that fruit note, it gives you length, right? Some tan, yeah. like the tannin, really nice tannins. That's the best thing about Cabernet mm -hmm. for me. You know, I find, I find it a bit bobo in terms of its, of its limited aromatic qualities and mm -hmm. stuff. The Merlot, Cabernet is known as having a donut. Okay. As being a donut grape, which means great up front. Right in the back, nothing in the middle. Hmm. So Merlot, wow, it's it's the tin bit, right? Yeah, it's the thing that you're missing, right? It I, fills I in that. I personally love Merlots, so <laughs> I me too. Like I think they're fabulous, but that fills that middle palate and gives it a little bit of texture. And because it's a little bit riper than you would find in Bordeaux, you find it like it's almost like a mix between, you know, a new world and an old world. Mm -hmm. aromatic right yeah. because it's a little bit riper right you got a little bit it's a little bit juicier especially uh, I, I believe this is 2020 which is a relatively hot year mm -hmm. so when you taste it that's delicious mm. Mm. Huh? now I have to question now you're in a happy place yeah I am <laughs> but now I also have to now I'm trying to figure out the, the reasoning for your choice for the music for this one. I think I could have gone in a different direction. Uh, it's, you know, again, like I never tell people what they should taste, mm -hmm. right? If you've, never, if you've never tasted a tomato, and I tell you it tastes like a tomato. But if I don't know what a tomato tastes like. But you're going to figure something else out that it tastes like, mm -hmm. right? Like there's no right or wrong answer in any of this. But right? don't get me wrong. I love the choice you came up with. <laughs> no, because for me... <laughs> For me, red wines are very plush, right? There's complexity, right? But there's not a lot of rough edges on this, on, on this, right? Like for me, there's not a lot of, you know, for me, it's very fluid. It's very, quite soft in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me, it's, it's the big, it's the lazy boy, right? It's a big plush thing, right? And you, even with like, yeah, maybe you got a little bit of veneer oak on your lazy boy, right? Mm -hmm. Just to, to make it, you know, it's the woody wagon of... Yeah, no, I don't have any of that. It's the woody wagon of chairs. But, you know, again, or it's this, like, super comfy chair. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, but this one, the good ones, have that nuance, have that complexity. Because the more that you go into this, or we just had one sip, yep. right? Is that, you know, for me, the Sangiovese brings almost like a little bit of a tobacco note, right? Like a little mm. bit of cigar note, right? Get that earthiness. I love a good cigar. And that acidious, <laughs> you know, and the, and the acids that you're getting as well. So for me, I like, it makes me think of something sort of richly textured, right? It starts off for me, you know, very almost uniform, right? You got this like fruit, boom. And then when you drink it, it just plushes out. And for me... Uh, that Steely Dan, it's a uh, Pretzel right? Logic album. Pretzel Logic, which is fabulous, and it's every. Give me the name of the song because I always mix it up. Which one? Damn thing. <laughs> Any major dude will tell ah, you. There we go. Which is one of my favorite Steely Dan songs. It's weird, you know. Once we switch to like CDs. It was, always Actually, number, it was always number four, number five. And what's right? funny is, is I have it only here on CD because finding the vinyl of this now has become a collector's item. I know I have that at home. And, but I just want to say thanks to Anne from our sales department. Actually, she actually brought this mm. for us. So thank you so much for bringing this. So that's, I, I might not return it. <laughs> no, so, but it starts with that really, like, really like, nice, you know, fluid sort of acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. but, but then the beat comes in. And then it just, you know, becomes steely done, right? This goes... You know what kind of direction I would have gone more for music? Yeah. Maybe more on the Jethro Tull side. Ooh. 
especially when you got Ian Anderson, you start getting into his more melodic uh, flute uh, notes and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. That's where I see myself with the red. I can see, but I, I, I tend to, I mean, everyone has their biases. Yeah. I tend to think most reds are a little bit dumber, right? So a little okay. bit more and like... I, and I come from a different perspective. You come from I a think. different perspective where you see complexity. For me, for me, <laughs> it's, it's, for me, what I love about this is the texture, mm -hmm. right? That sort of richness on the finish, that warmth that you get from the alcohol. Um, like for me, compared to, let's say, the Chablis, mm -hmm. aromatically and you don't have that, it's not as interesting or, in, or maybe as precise. Right, whereas this for me is this becomes this beautiful sort of carpet, this shag carpet of flavors and textures on the finish, right? So for me, that's that's why I tend to always move towards more of a a steely dan. But you know, again, but no, but steely dan pretzel logic is a fantastic. Oh, album. so yeah, it's, so great, it's great arguably album. their best album. Um, ever. we might be almost out of time already, uh, so <laughs> uh, we're we're gonna. I had a few questions, but I'm gonna reduce it down to one actually mm -hmm. because we do have an international audience, mm -hmm. and Canada has. We have our fair share of vineyards here yep. too. Now let's say if someone would come to visit the Canada, which wine would you recommend that comes from Canada? Uh, which wine? I would say, look, I just got back last night from Niagara. Niagara. Um, <laughs> which is a place I've been following for a long time. Um, got blown away by a number of wineries, so it's really hard for me to say, but if I was gonna drink, or if I was gonna go to Niagara mm -hmm. and go to one winery, mm -hmm. I would go to Hidden Bench. Hidden Bench. Ex-Montrealer who owns it, um, from their Riesling to their Chardonnay to their Pinot to these weird experimental wines they're making right now. Okay, and they have their brand. It's called Hidden Bench. It's called Hidden Bench. It's, Hidden Bench. It's something uh, even I think I'm going to check out now. No, it's one of the more forward-thinking wineries. Back in 2005, when they were when they were building it up, um, they went for solar and they went for. Um, more of a, an environmental perspective. Oh, they're cool. pretty well, or I mean, they're not 100% organic. They're close, and but the wines, which ultimately it's about, mm -hmm. um, were spectacular. And they even do like a Bordeaux blend um, that is magnificent. So for those who think that you can't make a great red of, sta of stature and bulk, mm -hmm. um, go drink the 2017 Brunante, which I drank, which was killer. And you still write reviews for the Montreal Gazette? Every Saturday. And it's also available online. You can sign up to their online subscription. You can see... Uh, yeah, it doesn't cost articles. anything. You just uh, go to the app and it's, yeah. uh, it comes out on Friday, so yeah. you get a head Fridays start. you get his articles and they're great articles too. So if you want to read up a bit more, so check out uh, the Gazette's website. And uh, Bill, thank you so much for coming. This, this was fun. This My was, pleasure, this man. Was that was great. Fun. <laughs> like, I might go, like, get a glass and listen to more stuff. Yeah, we're, we're probably going to go in the sound room after and just enjoy ourselves a little bit more. Yeah, but there anyways, you go. So that wraps it up. Actually, this is also our last episode for the summer, hence why I'm in the uh, more summery type of shirt today. Uh, we will be back at the end of September. We already have some great guests lined up in the fall. Yes, we already have those planned. We like planning in advance. And, I can tell um, you about that, yeah. <laughs> <Our test too. laughs> as someone who doesn't plan in advance he's like two months ago what are exactly. we going to do right? it's like, hey, Bill. <laughs> but uh, we will be back at the end of September so everyone enjoy your summer have a wonderful time et ici mes amis au Québec joyeux Saint Jean demain have a great and safe weekend take care and keep on listening